Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Seattle Public Schools first virtual financial aid event. We are so excited to have you join us tonight. I know this year is very different for everyone, but we want to make sure that everyone gets the support they need with um, applying for financial aid for college. My name is Krista Rillo. I am our district counselor in the Seattle Public Schools College and Career Readiness Office. And we are excited to have Christina Winstead from the Washington Student Achievement Council join us today. She is an expert in financial aid and she is going to give you everything you need to know to access financial aid for college. So I'm going to pass it over to Christina now. Christina, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Christina Winstead and I work with the Washington Student Achievement Council and I work with the 12th year campaign. And so what we do is our whole goal is to make sure every student has an opportunity to apply for financial aid. And how that works is through providing information, but also we will have some events to help you apply to. So today we're going to talk about financial aid, my favorite topic. And the reason why it's my favorite subject is because financial aid gave me the opportunity to find a career that I love every single day. It paid for me to get the training I need. So when I go to work every day, I love it. I love helping students with financial aid. And what I want for you is to think about where you are now and what you want to do with your life. What do you love? What are you passionate about? Not everything you love will earn a livable wage, but some of the things you love will. Um, I love scary movies and crafting. Will I earn a, a livable wage doing that? No. For those of you who said yes, thank you for your belief in my ability to craft. It's not that good, I promise. Uh, but I also love financial aid and helping people fund their pathways. And that's what I want for you. So think about what you love and we wanna help you map out where you are now and how to get to that career. And part of it is paying for it. So. I am a very frugal person and I wanna make sure that you guys can find the cheapest way to get to your goal. I want your generation to be the first generation in a long time to graduate without crippling financial debt. I want you to use all the resources available to you to be able to apply for financial aid and pay for your education. So let's talk about financial aid. When we talk about financial aid, it is four main categories. So we use this umbrella because really the term financial aid covers several different things. It's gonna cover grants, scholarships, loans, and work study. So those are the main four categories. Grants, they're income-based and they come from the state and the federal government. Scholarships, those you apply for separately. And then loans, this is something that you apply for through the financial aid application, the FOSFA or the WASA, and they are income-based and it's money you have to pay back. I know, that's kind of a bummer, but we're trying to reduce that as much as possible. And then work study. Work study is where you work on campus and sometimes off campus and you get paid. It's a job that they set aside money for to give you uh, those funds uh, while you're going to school. They are also income-based. So where does the money come from? It comes from four main areas. We love our fours. <laughs> so federal, state, colleges, and organizations. Federal funds you use uh, by applying for the FOSFA. They can be used in most institutions, state institutions. They can be used uh, out of state. Um, there's even some programs that'll help pay for you going uh, and doing a study abroad program. Then there is state uh, sources of financial aid. These are things like college bound. Uh, also the Washington College Grant, which is new to you uh, and is awesome. And then uh, the colleges will also offer funds. Those college funds are offered by a specific school to go to that school. So. For example, uh, University of Washington. If they offer you a scholarship, it's to go to that institution, but not another one. And finally, organizations. Organizations include businesses, churches. I mean, there's even grocery stores that offer scholarships. 
Um, and so they provide funding when you apply for it through an application for a scholarship. You would be surprised by how many places offer scholarships. Um, I have found them for uh, students who are left-handed, people who like to make a duct tape dress for prom. I mean, there's scholarships for everything. So when we talked about the places where aid comes from, and one of them is from federal government. So the federal government provides funding through the FOSFA, and that is uh, four different types of funding that comes with it. And the first one's Pell Grants. Grants, again, are money, it's funds that you don't have to pay back unless you're in a situation where, um, let's say you take out your money for school and you don't spend it on school and you drop your classes and don't attend. So I had a student do this once. Um, they took their financial aid money and they went to Vegas. Guess what financial aid is for? Not for Vegas. Sorry. So what ended up happening is that student, uh, they had to pay that money back because they never even attended their classes. Uh, so most of the time you won't have to pay back grant funds, but when you do, it's because of something called satisfactory academic progress. And so you just have to meet a certain standard uh, while going to school, like maintaining a GPA uh, in order to receive those funds. The other thing other than Pell Grant, which I love Pell Grant because it also helped me pay for my education, is that federal work study program. You can work for uh, federal programs for the school and sometimes outside of the school to earn money for college. Loans. I know this is the hard part, but there's two different types of loans when you apply for the FOSFA that could be offered to you, subsidized and unsubsidized. These are both student loans that you have to pay back. So I know that's the scary part, but you have to pay these, pay these uh, funds back. The biggest thing to think about when you're taking out a loan is um, you don't have to take the whole amount they offer you. They're gonna offer you so much money. And it's really about thinking about what you need versus what you want, because you have to pay that, fun, that money back. The other type of loan are parent loans. Parent loans are loans offered to your parent based on their income. So they're not available to all families, but they could be offered to you in your award letter. And these are all available to you by applying for the FOSFA. So this is what you'll be considered for. You'll also be considered for state aid. So these are our state aid programs. If you don't qualify for the FOSFA, you uh, may qualify for funding through the WASA, which is our state application for aid. And so when you do that, these are the funds you'd be considered for, which would be state funds. Uh, the first type of funding is the Washington College Grant, like literally one of my favorite things in the world, because it used to be the state need grant, which is what I received when I went to college. This provides funding for students um, and it's really more money for more students and more programs. You can use these funds to uh, register for an approved apprenticeship. You can use these funds uh, for a two-year school, a four-year school, a certificate. It really, whatever your pathway is, it really fits a lot of them. The next type of funding is the college-bound scholarship. So some of you will remember in middle school that you applied for a scholarship and got it. And if you don't remember, that's okay. Middle school was a long time ago, totally get it. Um, for the college bound scholarship, what you'll do is now that you are in uh, or high school, getting ready to go to college, you're gonna apply for financial aid to show that you meet the income guidelines. If you didn't apply for the scholarship in high school or in middle school, I mean, uh, that's okay. There are other types of funding that will help, don't worry. We also have state work study. So two different work study programs. Then there's passport to careers, and that's for our youth in care. So if you are a foster youth, we have different programs to support you through this pathway. Um, and if you get stuck at all, you're gonna reach out for help because I am happy to help you. Um, I make appointments with students, especially students who are youth in care to make sure that your application is complete. So you have a lot of supports available. And then finally, the Opportunity Grant, uh, which supports students through our Opportunity Pathways. For the Washington College Grant, this is just a little more information. 
like I said, it's a newer program. Uh, you guys are very lucky because uh, you're the second graduating class that has access to this with the expansion to apprenticeships. And also it allows your family to make more money and still get uh, what we call gift aid. If you're not sure if you will qualify for this, if you're watching and thinking, oh my goodness, I don't think we qualify. I want you to stop and, and, and go ahead and use our calculator. So a lot of families tell me, I'm not gonna qualify for financial aid. And in fact, I was one of those students. When I went to our financial aid night, when I was in high school, I, um, I heard from a friend of a friend's mom that we wouldn't qualify for financial aid. So what I did, was um, I took the two pieces of pizza that they offered me, wrapped them up in napkins and put them in my pocket. Um, spoilers, uh, if you are pocketing pizza for dinner, um, you're probably uh, not as rich as the people told me I was. So when I graduated from high school, I asked my mom, how are we paying for college? And she said, you're gonna get some jobs. Here's jobs, plural there, plural. So I had to go get three jobs. I worked in the mall. I was a sandwich artist. Uh, that's code y'all for Subway. Uh, I also, uh, uh, in addition to that, worked at Payless with some BOGO action and the Swiss pretzel, the twist you can't resist, but y'all could because it went out of business while I was standing there. Um, I worked these three jobs and sadly failed my first quarter of college because when you work 12 hours a day to pay for school, it really doesn't leave a lot of time for homework. Uh, and then my second quarter, uh, a friend told me, hey, I got 40 bucks from financial aid. And I was like, that's awesome. I'm going to apply. Because at that point, $40 meant me not smelling like pepperoncinis for a week. And so I was completely ready for that. So I applied for financial aid and they gave me uh, basically what they call full ride. They paid for my tuition, my fees, and my books. And they gave me a little bit of money afterwards to pay for other needs. Um, and so it was really awesome. And I could drop two of those jobs and I just work one job through college. Because I listened to someone else about what I qualified for, I almost gave up my opportunity for financial aid. And in fact, I probably, if I hadn't talked to a financial aid officer and applied for aid, would have dropped out and not finished college. Uh, and I guarantee being a sandwich artist was not the thing I loved most in life. And so it gave me an opportunity really to do what I love. If you think you don't qualify, Use the financial aid calculator to see if you qualify. Let the application tell you, but please don't let anyone else tell you whether you qualify for aid or not. Of course, the only way to know for sure is to apply for financial aid. So which one, how do you apply? That's the, the big topic today. Um, you can apply by using one uh, or the other application. You only use one application, the FOSFA or the WAFSA. Uh, the FOSFA application is for students who have a social security number or for, uh, from a free, freely associated state like Marshall Islands. Uh, if you don't qualify for the FOSFA, you're going to assess yourself for the WAFSA. The WAFSA is for students who don't qualify for the FOSFA, uh, who have DACA status, or who have expired DACA status. The application opens in October every year. Like my favorite month is October because uh, all the extra candy and financial aid and not pumpkin spice as much as apple spice, you guys. So every October, whenever things get pumpkin spice and everything nice out there, you are going to apply for financial aid every year that you go to school. So you're going to do this every single year. Uh, class of 2021, congratulations. Um, you are going to use the 2021-2022 FOSFA or WASA. I know it sounds super futuristic, but that's the year you're going to college. You're gonna use your income information from 2019. So your taxes, as well as information about any income that you earned. And you're gonna apply early to make sure you have as many uh, options as possible. Uh, sometimes you can put an error in an application for financial aid. And what ends up happening is it can hold up your application. So you may think you've met a deadline, but you haven't because it hasn't been completed. If you finish early, it gives you time to fix any errors and maximize opportunities for aid. So if you qualify for the FOSFA, your first step is to do an FSA ID. The FSA ID is just basically you saying, hey, Uncle Sam, 
I'm going to college next year and I'm gonna need you to pony up some of this cash. It's you creating an account. You're gonna to need to create an account and your parent may need to create an account. Your parent will need to create an account uh, if they have a social security number. If they don't, no problem. They're gonna sign your application with a paper application. So you'll fill out your application online and your, pa uh, your parent will sign it uh, physically. The FSA ID takes about 15 minutes to create and you can do this at any time. So you'll go ahead and get your social security number. You wanna enter it in as exactly as listed on your social security card. So this is a formal federal process. So for the first time, you have to follow everything that's on your social security card, because if you don't, it won't match. And that can be really hard uh, because it'll throw an error and takes a while to resolve. So you're gonna go slowly through this process, create your FSA ID um, accurately. And when you do this, also make sure that you verify either your email or your phone number, or preferably both. If you don't verify one of those and you lose your information and can't access your account, like you need to reset your password, if you don't have those, you have to send them a physical Xerox copy of your driver's license or ID to the federal government and wait six to eight weeks for them to unlock it. So it's way better if you use an email that you can verify. Also, don't use your high school email. You'll lose access to your high school email after you graduate. So this is a great time to create an email address that will not make an admissions officer blush. Just saying, my boss used to make me read email addresses out loud, and literally some of them I could not read without losing my job. Don't be that student. Make sure you have a professional one, especially if you are providing that information to an admissions officer. Also make sure it's an email address you'll check. You know, that really important part. So after you apply, what happens next? So for you, you're gonna apply for admissions. You're gonna apply for admissions at all the colleges you're interested in. You can put 10 colleges on the FAFSA or WAFSA. So we want you to dream big um, and then narrow down those uh, list of schools later on. Uh, so you apply for admissions, you're applying for financial aid, and then if you get a letter, an email, I don't care if they send a pigeon to you, if you get any sort of contact from a college uh, or from WASAC, please respond. And this is why. If you don't respond to their requests, sometimes you can miss out on aid. I mean, a lot of aid. I had a student who missed out on $4,000 last year because they didn't respond to one email that said, hey, you qualify for these funds. We just need to know you need those funds and they did not receive them. So make sure you're in contact with your colleges. The next step for the agency I work for, which maintains the WAFSA, and then also the federal government who maintains the FAFSA, is they're gonna maintain the application. And then when you fill out the application, we send that information to the schools you listed. Now the colleges, they're gonna go ahead and let you know if you qualify for financial aid, if you've been admitted to the school, they're gonna answer your questions about financial aid and I'm talking the whole time you're in school. And then while you're in school, they're gonna provide you that extra support. And that's really important right now, especially um, when we have uh, issues like the current pandemic. There are additional funds that have been offered to students um, to help support them through the pandemic. And you have to reach out to your college to receive those. So they will continually work with you um, to support you with funding. Another financial aid piece that you might be asked to do is the CSS profile. The CSS profile is an application through the College Board that helps schools understand your financial situation uh, more in depth than the FAFSA or the WAFSA. It's only required by a couple schools in Washington State, uh, but I want you to be aware of it because it is something that you may see. It costs $25 to uh, report your first application, and then you can send reports out to schools for 16 bucks a piece. Now I know that sounds pricey and I already said I'm frugal. So I wanna make sure you know there's fee waivers. Uh, you just have to talk to your counselor. Uh, if you qualify for college board fee waivers for the SAT, you'll be able to qualify for fee waivers for the CSS profile. Okay, in the process of financial aid, there is something called verification. 
it's just basically where they're verifying information you have provided. It is a process that is random and it's standard, which means that one third of all students will be selected to provide additional information. It's also used to clarify information. Like last year, I had a student, um, their family listed that they made $62,000 a year. The student uh, had to list their income. And of course they thought, well, if mom and dad make that, it's my money too. So I made 62,000 as well. But unfortunately, what it did was duplicate the income. So now the student no longer was eligible for gift aid. But the financial aid officer saw this and reached out to the student and said, so you're, you're 18, you just turned 18, and um, you made $62,000 last year. I'm in the wrong profession, what are you doing? The student said, I didn't make anything last year. Well, let's fix that. And they fixed the application and the student was now eligible for gift aid. Awesome. That gets them the training they need so they can go make that 62,000 down the road. Uh, it's really important to pay attention to your requests. They will either email you, sometimes they'll send you a letter, sometimes it's a notification in the portal. Whatever way they contact you, you have to respond. If you're selected for verification and you don't complete the process, what they'll end up doing is not process the application. They literally can't provide funds to you because you've been selected for federal verification. Uh, the best thing to do is start the process. And if you get stuck, ask for help from the college that you're going to. Um, it is just one of those things that uh, I've had to do it four times myself. Uh, most of you will experience it at least once. And it does keep students from going to college. If you get stuck, reach out. We do not want you to not be able to go to college because of a process. So we're here to support you. I talked a little bit earlier about College Bound. So here's the College Bound scholarship information. Again, you signed up in seventh or eighth grade. So if you don't remember, totally fine. I don't remember what I did back then too. No worries. Uh, your council will know if you're a College Bound student. This is gonna combine these funds with Washington State Aid to cover your tuition. And that's at public rates. So what that means is if you go to a private school, they're going to provide you the highest rate of public tuition, which is University of Washington. And then you will apply for scholarships to cover the difference between public and private tuition rates. It's also going to cover some fees and a small book allowance. And it works again with other types of aid to provide a financial aid package. These funds have to be used in Washington State and you can use them at over 62 and four year schools and you can use them at private colleges as well. You have to meet the college bound pledge to receive these funds. So you've got to graduate from a Washington State high school with a 2.0 GPA or better. Um, that is a C average. And as a poster child of a 90s slacker, if I can do it, you can do it too. Don't worry. Um, you can't have any felony convictions. Uh, and just letting you know now, if you do have felony convictions, there is still aid available for students. Please reach out to me. I'm working to make sure that incarcerated and formerly incarcerated youth have opportunities, and I would love to talk to you about opportunities available to you. Um, you have to meet income eligibility through the FOSCA or WASA. And then um, you have to enroll in college within one year of graduating. So you have five years to use four years worth of funding, which means you can take a gap year. But we want you to make a plan because a gap year can turn into a gap decade real quick, real talk. Um, and then again, I said you have that five years to use four years of funding. So if you start right away and let's say life happens and you have to take a break, you can take like a, a semester or even a whole year off and still have access to that scholarship. Krista, would you like to talk about the Seattle Promise, which is awesome? Yes, I'm excited to tell everyone about Seattle Promise. Um, we are lucky in Seattle Public Schools to have access to Seattle Promise. Um, and this is a scholarship that um, all students that graduate from Seattle Public Schools um, can access if, through the application process. Um, it covers two years of tuition at any of the Seattle colleges. So that would be North Seattle, South Seattle, Seattle Central College. Um, all high school seniors are eligible for the scholarship regardless of GPA, income, or country of birth. 
To participate, students need to apply by February 1st. The application is currently open. Um, students will also need to submit that FAFSA or WASPA. That's why we're talking to you all today. It's so important. Um, and make sure when you fill out your FAFSA or your WASPA that you submit the Seattle colleges that you're interested in going to, make sure you list them in your FAFSA or WASPA. It'll just make the process easily easier um, when you do want to access the um, Seattle Promise Scholarship. Um, and additionally, um, there's additional information on the slide just as far as um, visuals and their email address is seattlecolleges.edu backslash promise. Um, we do have representatives from Seattle Promise um, joining us on the uh, during the presentation today. They are participating and I do want to let everyone know we are having some issues with the Q&A. Um, it looks like it may not have been configured, so we are going to be putting up a slide at the end of the presentation that will have a link you can go to to submit your questions and we will do Q&A at the very end. So if you have additional questions about Seattle Promise, um, we'll, we'll give you a way to get those questions out at the end, but for now just know that is an amazing opportunity. There are Seattle Promise support staff um, connected to each of the high schools that will be reaching out to students um, and you can also go to that website for additional information. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The Seattle Promise is not, you guys are very fortunate because uh, it's not something that's offered like programs like this across the state. You are very lucky to be uh, in the Seattle area. If you're not sure which college you want to go to, you can put all three of those schools on your application, no problem, and then decide later where you want to go. So another uh, opportunity for scholarships is the washboard. The washboard is a scholarship warehouse where we vet the scholarships to make sure they're not scams. And then we put them into our website and you build a profile and we match you to them. I affectionately call it the eHarmony of scholarships. You build the profile and then it matches you to it, except for like this is probably better because we vet them. Um, so what happens is you'll go ahead and build a profile and I would do this as soon as possible and then see what's available to you. Uh, not all the scholarships are going to be open right now, uh, but there may be some open soon. And scholarship season really starts now and goes all the way through spring. And here are some additional scholarship search engines. So there's other ways to pay for college. If you have a 529 savings plan, uh, sometimes they're called get plans or a dream ahead plan. This is when you're gonna talk to your family about it. You're gonna wanna know who owns the account because that's important in the financial aid process. Um, you may have savings uh, that you've already put aside for college or you might be working through college. Um, I personally worked full time through uh, all of my education uh, and was able to pay off a hunk of my education while going to school. And then payment plans. There were some quarters where I couldn't pay um, directly for like a summer class where they let me break my payment down into four payments, which was totally doable. I couldn't pay the 500 up front, but I could pay 125, no problem. And so they worked with me through a payment plan all through the quarter so I could pay off my tuition and for the quarters that I did not have financial aid. Don't forget to check the FOSFA website and the WAFSA website for the most up-to-date information. Uh, and then if you get a phone call, especially a phone call, but emails, any sort of correspondence, please respond back to your prospective colleges. Again, a uh, delayed response could cost you money. You're going to reapply for financial aid every single year. Like I said before, when it gets pumpkin spice and everything nice out there, you're going to also think about financial aid and how you're paying for college. Um, and then this is a big one. If your financial aid situation has changed from 2019 to 2020, um, especially if you've experienced a decrease in income, this is very common. So if your income has decreased, what you want to do is reach out to your financial aid office. So 
So here are some planning resources to help. We have financial aid events coming up soon. Um, we have one tomorrow, but it's pretty full. But our event on the 15th and the 24th have lots of room. Uh, your districts will also have financial aid completion events as well. If you need help applying for financial aid, please attend one of these events, either through your school or through us, so that you can get the assistance you need to apply. You can also go to our action page website. This is built spe specifically for students in mind, and we have workbooks to help you walk through um, admissions, financial aid, how to pick a college based upon your interests, uh, not based upon like maybe where your best friend is going, but what's best for you as an individual. And then you have uh, other planning resources. Kristen, would you like to talk about Naviance, which is awesome? Again, you guys have so many cool tools. Yes, so I am really excited to additionally share with you all some of the, uh, these resources in Seattle, and Naviance is a big one. Um, all Seattle Public Schools in grades 6 through 12 can access Naviance. Um, it is in your student portal right now. Parents can also request accounts. Um, you can go to www.seattleschools.org backslash Naviance to get more information as well. But all students can go into the student portal, click on that Naviance, Naviance icon and get access to um, all sorts of college and career research tools. You can take interest inventories, research colleges, um, use the Fit Finder tool, Supermatch to find out what colleges are a good fit for you. Um, start making lists of the colleges you're applying to and request your transcripts from your counselors. Um, so there's just tons of things in there. It's available at your fingertips. Um, and we want to make sure that you know about that resource, that you're accessing it. Your counselors will also be visiting your um, virtual classrooms this year to deliver some lessons through Naviance to assist you with your college and career planning. Um, but do know that that's available. And again, you can go to that website listed there um, to get additional information. And that's where parents can also request accounts as well. Um, we are also doing a couple more events taking place later in the month and in early November to provide additional support beyond just this presentation to actually help you all with filing um, either with the WASPA or FAFSA. We'll have breakout rooms, um, with experts on hand to help you step by step through the process or just answer any specific questions you have. Um, so those dates are available there. Um, you can also just see a full, um, the registration links will be available on the website listed here. Um, they're not up yet, um, but they will be shortly. Um, and we've also listed some of the additional state events that Christina mentioned there as well. Yes, please attend an event for assistance. We want to make sure that you have all the support you need to take these next steps for your post-secondary uh, goals. And then for the Washington Student Achievement Council, uh, here's contact information for us. If you need information for looking at a GET account, we have access there. Uh, we're on Twitter and Facebook. If you have any questions about financial aid, you can also call us. The biggest thing is just to make sure that you reach out if you have questions. Um, unfortunately, we're not psychic. If we were, uh, we'd have different jobs. Uh, and so we don't know when you have questions and you have to be an advocate for yourself uh, when you do have those questions. So always reach out when you need help. So that's the end of our pre presentation component. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close out that screen for you guys. And we're going to go ahead and go over to questions. And while we're getting questions ready, I did want to talk for a second more about change of income. So again, I talked before about what to do if your income has decreased from 2019 to 2020. Very common right now. A lot of families are experiencing a decrease in income. Uh, we want to make sure, though, in the financial aid process that they're assessing that. So if your family is making less than they were in 2019, you're going to reach out to the colleges that you apply to 
to make sure they assess you based upon your 2020 income through what they call professional judgment. And so what they'll do is uh, assess your situation and see if you qualify for additional aid based upon uh, what you are currently making. Uh, you'll typically provide documents showing the decrease of income. Uh, sometimes they'll ask for a layoff notice or a termination notice if it's a job loss situation uh, or furloughs. And then what will happen is they can assess you uh, for your current situation. So don't worry if that's the case. There's lots of support uh, and a lot of families are going through this right now. The biggest thing is to remember is to not delay applying for financial aid. You'll apply using your 2019 information and then you'll follow up with your colleges. Okay, so in just a moment, we'll take maybe a brief break, um, just one minute um, while we transition to our um, slide for questions. And once this gets posted up, we'll just take a few minutes um, for everyone to ask their questions. Um, we're going to be shortly here putting up a slide that has a, a web address you can go to to submit your questions. And I apologize that our Q&A um, wasn't set up uh, correctly tonight, but we um, we are doing a workaround here. So for, we're taking a, a brief break and that will be up in just one minute. So get your questions ready. And we'll be right back. All right, feel free to go ahead and enter any questions you have by going to that link that's up. Um, we'll be checking them. We'll take about um, a few minutes here. And if we don't get anything within the next five minutes, um, we will assume there are no questions today. And Christina was amazing. Um, but again, let's go to bit.ly backslash SPS FinAid 2020 and that will take you to a form where you can um, ask your questions.
Okay, questions are starting to come in. Thank you everyone for working with us on this. Um, so first question is, will these slides be available? Yes, um, we have recorded this and the slides will also be available. Um, we will distribute them out to schools. Um, I will also look into seeing if we can get them posted to the website where um, these, um, the event link was. Um, so stay tuned for that, um, but we will also make sure it gets out to schools for them to post on their websites as well. Um, let's see what else do we have. Um, yep, PDF presentate format. Um, we will make sure that gets posted and is accessible to everyone in a PDF format. So thank you. Can you sign up for both the FAFSA and the WASPA? I'm going to let oh. Christina go into that again. That is a great question. You only have to do one. I mean, who wants to do more than one application? Let's not kid ourselves. You're going to do the application that you qualify for. So if you have a social security number or from a freely associated state like Marshall Islands, you'll do the FOSFA. And if not, you're going to assess yourself for the WASA if you don't qualify for the FOSFA to apply for aid through the state. You know what happens when you apply for both applications? Number one, y'all give me a bunch of gray hairs. Number two, the system gets really confused on which one you're supposed to do. So it holds up your application. So just do the one you qualify for. I didn't unmute my mic. I was talking to myself there for a minute. Um, OK, this is another one for Christina. If I have a 529, if I have 529 accounts for each of my two children, do I have to declare, declare both accounts as assets in the FAFSA? For that one, it's going to depend on who the account holder is. If the accounts are in your children's names, the student's going to declare it as an asset uh, in the financial aid application. If it's in your name, you'll declare it. Um, and then if it's in a grandparent's name, the student will declare that somebody paid financial aid funds in the next year's application. So it really comes down to who's the owner. If you own both accounts in your name, it's gonna probably ask for information on both accounts as an asset, which is um, calculated at a much lower percent than income. Great, and this one sounds similar. I think you've covered it, um, but feel free to chime in, chime in if there's an additional factor here that I'm not catching, Christina. Um, we have a GET program for both our daughters. One is in her second year of college and a 529 plan. Are those our daughter's assets or ours? Again, it depends on whose name it's in. If it's in your daughter's name, it's her asset. Um, so it's it really you want to look at the paperwork to see who's the account holder on the application. But awesome that you have get accounts and a 529 account. Way to go. That is that is pretty awesome. Great planning. So um, yeah, and another request for the PowerPoints. Um, I will get those posted and if you don't see them um, either through your school website or through our district website by the um, End of the week, feel free to email ccr at seattleschools.org. ccr at seattleschools.org, and I can send it to you personally. Um, that is our College and Career Readiness Department address. Um, and there's actually a very similar link um, on the state website as well that has um, these slides, the link that Christina shared. Um, Let's see, when do I use my income versus my parents' income in an application? Ah, that's another great question. You guys have good ones. Okay, so when you're applying for financial aid, uh, you will either be considered dependent or independent until the age of 24. That's the magical age in which you are considered no longer dependent on your parents for financial aid purposes. That's for most students, but students in certain circumstances can uh, be considered independent and like as soon as they apply. So if you've been in foster care after the age of 13 or you're in a legal guardianship um, or uh, you're at risk for homelessness uh, or have a McKinney-Vento determination, there's a lot of different circumstances that would make you considered 
independent, which means they're only looking at your income. But typically for students, they're going to look at both the parent and the student's income until the age of 24. Well, until you turn 24. Um, if you have your own dependents, so if you're a student with children, you have to provide 51% or more of the support to be considered independent. And if you go to the FAFSA website, there's a uh, little like flow chart you can take where you can answer questions and see if you're dependent or independent. Great. Um, when is the FAFSA application due? Oh, the uh, FAFSA or WAFSA, they're both due based upon your school's deadlines. So you want to make sure you're meeting the college's deadlines for financial aid. Your colleges will have admissions deadlines and financial aid deadlines, and usually they're not the same date. So you want to make sure you're looking at your college's website, and I would encourage you to build a spreadsheet where you list the school's name, uh, you know, the application deadline, admissions deadline, scholarships deadline. I'm all about spreadsheets because I'm a dork, but whatever works best for you, just make sure that you know when your deadlines are going to be, but they vary from school to school. And some of them are coming up soon, like some of them will be in the middle of November. All right, so our next question is, when do you, what do you put on the FAFSA in the college list if you don't know what college you, will, you want to apply to? Ah, this is where you get to explore. Put down anything you might be interested in, but at a bare minimum, uh, put a school that you know you uh, could happily attend that you'll get into. So the community colleges in Washington State are open door admissions. Anyone who applies is admitted to the schools. That's a great place to start if you know you're staying close to home or doing the Seattle Promise. So at a bare minimum, maybe putting the Seattle Promise schools on your financial aid application. In the meantime, you're going to explore all your college options and narrow it down and go back in and add more schools to your application. So you can list up to 10. If you have more than 10 that you're interested in, you're going to apply with the first 10 and then you're going to wait two weeks and update with your next uh, batch of interested schools you're interested in. Yeah, that's great. You can always go back in and update, which because, you know, we all change our minds. Yeah, it's, it's OK if you change your mind about where you want to go to college and to be perfectly honest, you can also change your major. There's so many changes. It's never too late to make a change, uh, especially if it means that you're going down the right pathway for yourself. Okay, are the 1020 and 11 for events for need-based aid only? No, they are for assisting you with actually completing um, the financial aid applications. So uh, anyone can apply for those and um, colleges um, use them for both merit and need-based aid. Um, some scholarships use them as well. So we encourage people to, to apply, um, but we'll be supporting you with filling out the FAFSA um, and the WASPA based on what, what you want to complete. All right, I love it. Great questions, guys. Um, OK, we're still going here. For students who are English language learners, is there a way to set up a one on one appointment in their home language to get their FAFSA or WASPA done correctly? Um, we can work on getting you connected to resources. Um, Christina, I don't know if that's something you have available at the state level. Um, but we, um, I do have some contacts through some of our community partners that we can get you connected to, or um, we can um, just include one of our ELL and um, IAs, instructional assistants, who speaks your language and include them on a meeting that we set up. So I would go ahead and again email ccr at seattleschools.org and we will make sure to get you connected to the support you need. We will also have ELL interpreters available at the events we have coming up later in the month. If you go to our website where the events are being posted, we have the languages listed, um, which languages are available at which event. And for, for WASAC, unfortunately, we don't have uh, the ability for that right now. Um, we're a little more limited. Uh, it's me and another person, and so, uh, 
Uh, I am in the process of learning Spanish. I promise I wish I could learn every language, but we don't have the capacity right now um, for those. So I would definitely depend on your district for that at this point. We do have translated materials. Uh, we have workbooks in five languages that we can send to you in English, Spanish, Vietnamese, Somali, and Russian. Um, and we are working on translating into other languages as well. All right, we're still keeping more more questions are coming through. This is great. I love it, everyone. Um, all right, next question. My son is in Running Start. He is a senior. He's pretty sure he will get his high school diploma, but maybe not his AA. Should he be applying for the FAFSA now, just in case he does go to college in fall 2021? Definitely. Um, I highly encourage him to apply just in case. Um, you know, life happens, and especially in a year where kind of things have been kind of uh, different, uh, having access to aid and knowing it's there may be something uh, that he will want access to in the summer, uh, especially with running start and, and graduating if they don't complete their AA and they want to continue on at the community college. And if they want to continue on at a university for the transfer degree, they'll also want to apply for aid. And that is awesome. Running Start is a great program. All those dual credit students out there, uh, it, it pays off, especially when you go to college and you have a transcript already. Okay, so I just had to refresh. Um, here we go. If I get a two year degree at a Seattle college and then transfer to the UW Dub at age 20 ish, will they look at my parents' financial situation for determining my eligibility for aid? or will they look at my own? Uh, again, it'll depend on if you're considered dependent or independent for FOSFA purposes. So you'll do the assessment for dependency. They don't look at what grade level you're at, like whether it's an associate's or a bachelor's in that process. If you were getting a master's, that is one at one point that they will consider you independent, but for your bachelor's, um, they'll still use the same dependency criteria um, for everybody else. All right, next question. How do I know what my asset protection allowance value is for the FAFSA? And am I supposed to reduce my reported assets amount by that value? Um, that is a really good question. Um, Might be a tax. Uh, Yes, that is more of a tax. Uh, so when it comes to reporting your assets, um, I encourage you, like, it's really hard to hide assets when it comes to financial aid. Uh, and so I, people ask me, how's the best way I can report my assets? I would just report them as is, uh, because if you're selected for verification, um, they're gonna verify those assets. For example, um, you know, I had someone say they didn't have any money in savings, but then on their taxes, it showed that they were receiving interest payments from their bank for a large sum in a savings account that triggered a, a verification report. Um, so for that one, um, um, if you want to read it to me again, Krista, I just that's one I am not as familiar with. Um, how do I know my asset protection allowance value? Um, what that is for the FAFSA, and am I supposed to reduce my reported assets amount by that value, the asset protection allowance value? What is it, and should uh, I? So um, it is. Let's see here. Decrease by the seven year. Oh wow, it's pretty low for the asset protection allowance. Um, it. It's dropped down to 9,400 for 2021. So um, I think it'd be hard to, like, I would just use that as your kind of guideline. Um, and when in doubt, you can always talk to, I would talk to the college for the for their financial aid experts there um, when you have concerns about your assets. The other place they're definitely gonna report all of those is if you use a CSS profile because it goes much more in depth than the FAFSA or the WAFSA. 
OK, we're, we've got quite a few more questions, so we're just going to cruise on through. Um, next one for changes in income in 2020. Do we contact the individual colleges and talk to their financial aid office before or after the student is admitted? I would talk to them before, so I'd submit your financial aid application and then contact the college and let them know you've applied and that you your income situation has changed just to give them a heads up. Uh, it's not something they're considering, like it doesn't impact the admissions process, um, but at least then you know that if you're admitted to that school, you've started the process to do a change of income. And I say this because there will be a lot of them this year, so schools are going to have, it may take longer to process. Um, I, I ask for a lot of patients this year uh, with our colleges, I know that staffing has been short and uh, it, it really is there's a lot of applications that come in so i know that they are working really hard processing everything as quickly as they can um so this is a great question do we have individual financial aid counselors or is it just christina so <laughs> <laughs> so for the state christina is kind of our state expert but there are a lot of other resources your school counselors do have some knowledge and a lot of our schools um have partners that they work closely with like um College Success Foundation, College Possible Washington, Upward Bound, um, and those are several resources that are in a lot of our buildings. Um, our buildings also have career center specialists um, or um, career connected learning coordinators who are also um, great resources. So I would encourage you to reach out to your school and find out what some of your school ba school based resources are. I don't know if you have anything else you want to add to that, Christina. Um, yeah, you have amazing resources at your schools. Yeah, I'm kind of the the, the person for the statewide. Uh, I also have about 175 schools right now, uh, so it's kind of it's it's hard. But you're, you're always welcome to reach out to me, and uh, if you have questions, but you also have your supports at your school as well. Um, and if schools open back up again, you may even see me in your buildings. OK, next question. Could you say more about middle income families and applying for FAFSA? Yeah, so for middle income families, I I encourage you to apply for FAFSA or WAFSA because the Washington College Grant has expanded eligibility. For example, a family of four making ninety seven thousand a year or less is going to receive some partial gift aid, which means money uh, that's that's income based. Uh, they increase that threshold with the Washington College Grant. So it's changed from maybe previous experiences. Uh, another reason why you'll want to apply for financial aid is because it's how you receive loans, federal loans specifically. Uh, you're also able to apply for private loans, but some of the benefits of having federal loans, like right now during this pandemic, all of our interest has been held. So you can make payments and it goes straight to principal. That has been wonderful, but also the fact that they've said you don't have to make payments until December has really allowed a lot of families um, to to not uh, go into um, uh, well for they're, they're able to go into forbearance right now. So it's been very helpful, whereas private loans have not had that opportunity. So when you're applying for the FOSPA, you're applying also for loan opportunities. And then um, another thing is scholarships want to see that a family is a middle income family for some scholarships to determine if you have what's called unmet needs. So they know that you're not receiving full gift aid uh, and you may not be able to meet your cost of attendance. And sometimes those scholarships need to see that through what's called your EFC, which is a calculation you receive when you apply for financial aid. Yeah, so bottom line, it's important just to apply because it opens the door for lots of other aid opportunities. And there's lots of even merit-based, as she said, scholarships that still want to see um, that you filed that FAFSA, even if they don't have a need-based requirement. Um, and then we're still getting into this a little bit more about which one do I use? I'm a bit confused about which application. Is it right that you can apply only for the federal or, or the state assistance? How do I know which one I should apply to? So uh, the two applications, if you qualify for the FOSPA, which means uh, you have a social security number or from freely associated state, when you apply for the FOSPA, you're being considered for federal and state aid at the same time. So just one application covers both. 
If you don't qualify for the federal application, you're going to use the WAFSA just to be considered for state aid because in Washington, uh, we have a law that allows students, uh, whether they are documented or undocumented, to receive financial aid. Uh, so they know that all students are going to need access to funding uh, to make sure that we have a trained workforce. Uh, you guys are literally the future. Uh, and you're going to run this world, and we want to make sure that you have the training you need and an affordable rate uh, so that you can run this world uh, in the jobs that you want. So uh, you apply for the FOSFA or the WAFSA, depending on your situation. And if you apply for the FOSFA, you're getting state and federal. And if you apply for the WAFSA, it's just state aid. State aid can only be used in Washington state. So what suggestions, tips do you have for seniors who are applying for financial aid as well as school? I'm not sure if I fully understand that question, Christina. You may be able to interpret it. Um, um, I'm going to take a guess that if there's a lot to do all at once. I know that it's like it's your like your senior year, which is exciting. And then all of a sudden we're like, and by the way, you have to apply for college. You're going to apply for more than one. You have to apply for financial aid. And it seems like a lot to do all at once. The cool thing is there's supports, and so you have those events for assistance, and um, you're, you can start your admissions applications now. So it's about making sure that you have a plan on how you're going to complete these things. So are you going to do a virtual weekend with your friends where you do applications together? How are you all going to support each other in this? Um, but I know that's the most common thing I hear from students is, uh, don't you all know we have other things to do? And we do. We just know that you have to apply for financial aid and admissions, and this is the time of year that that falls. And we're going to try our best to support you, even though and we know that it's a lot of work, but we promise the payoff is amazing. Great. Um, how, does, how do the FAFSA and Promise Scholarship work together? Because you have to apply for both. If I do qualify for FAFSA, will I not qualify for the Promise um, or program or vice versa. So a lot of scholarships, like we were saying, want you to file the FAFSA and Promise is one of those. Um, usually to access uh, scholarship programs and aid, you need to file the FAFSA first. Um, so you need to complete that FAFSA to get access to your Promise scholarship. And as long as you meet all the milestones that Seattle Promise um, has as part of their application process, they have several steps you need to complete to access your Seattle Promise Scholarship, you will get the scholarship. Um, they just need you to fill out that FAFSA as one of those steps. Um, and so I hope that explains a little bit better how those work together, but I think the, the real key is that FAFSA is so important in um, getting access to a lot of scholarships and Promise is one of those examples. Um, where can I find institutions that give scholarships? Do you want to oh. take that, Christina? Yes, so um, most colleges will have a foundation that fundraises and part of their mission is to provide scholarships. So I encourage you to just Google the school's name that you want to go to, uh, UW Foundation Scholarships, or even just the school name that you want to go to in scholarships. And it usually there's a, usually a scholarship landing page for each school. So like UW has their own scholarship page and it lists out all the scholarships specifically for UW and all of the outside scholarships as well. Um, same with the community colleges. And in fact, when I worked at the community college, you'd fill out one application and it applied you to multiple scholarships at once for that school. So you want to check with your institutional scholarships first and foremost. And you can always reach out to your financial aid office of that college and ask about more funding opportunities. It's OK to say, um, I, I need help paying for this. Um, I've applied for financial aid, but I need more money for school. It's OK to tell them that because they will keep you in mind for maybe other opportunities or let you know that there's a scholarship coming up. Great. OK, um, can you speak to 529 plans in children's names versus parents for FAFSA? I think we covered this earlier, so we're probably good unless you think there's anything we need to add, Christina. If it's the children and the children's name, it's the children's asset. So it's the student's asset then. Um, what is the maximum family annual income that doesn't qualify for financial aid? It depends on the size of the family. So that financial aid calculator uh, that I talked about will walk you through and tell you 
um, what your cutoff is, but it, it, it changes with the number of people in the household. Um, and it's by percentage. Um, it then co um, prorates down the gift aid. So if you use that calculator, you'll be able to understand, know what your family should be um, considered for. All right, this leads right into on the FAFSA calculator, it asks you to input your expected family contribution in order to work out how much aid you may receive. How do you work out your EFC? Uh, your EFC is something that you'll get, um, and it's something you may already uh, know from a previous application. When you apply for financial aid, they will give you your calculation um, for like the finalized EFC. There's also an EFC kind of uh, generator on the FAFSA website. And so it's just basically a calculation they do where they look at um, the cost of college, how much your family makes, things like that. And it, it basically calculates out um, different funding levels. And scholarships may need it too, so you'll want to write it down. Is there a hard copy of the FAFSA available? Yes, so the paper FAFSA is available right now. Uh, it is a slower process to apply on paper because it takes them longer to process the application, um, but it is an application I use very commonly especially with incarcerated youth because it's the only application they have access to. Um, it is like six pages, don't worry, a lot of its instructions. <laughs> um, and you can use the FAFSA website in order to um, ask uh, more in-depth questions if you have a question about what they're asking on the application. Great. So this next one's about our Seattle Promise. Um, what are the eligibility requirements for a Seattle Promise? How is income a factor? Um, income is just a factor in that they want you to um, complete the FAFSA or the WASPA um, just as part of one of the steps. You need to graduate from Seattle Public Schools, um, apply to the Seattle College that you plan on attending, complete that FAFSA, and complete some of the other milestones that they have, which involves um, attending kind of an orientation transition um, event that they offer um, as well as completing some other forms that the um, the uh, college requires um, and registration um, so really just following all those steps to enroll in the college and filling out all the steps for um, the Seattle Promise application and then um, making sure you fill out that FAFSA are, are the main the main steps um, and those are all listed on their website as well for Seattle Promise. Um, all right. Um, my daughter may not obtain her AA through Running Start before she graduates. Can she use Promise for the summer before she goes to her college of choice? Um, I don't believe Promise is accessible until the fall, but I'm going to ask our Promise staff that are on the call to go ahead and email um, that answer to me to verify, and I'll come back to that um, to let you all know. The student can also apply for regular financial aid um, for summer, which is the first quarter of the 2021-2022 application. Oh, great. So they just want to add the community college and the university that they want to go to as well on the application. Awesome. Um, it, oh, and a side note, it may limit, like they can only go so many quarters a year, so it can impact spring quarter funding if they take a summer quarter. So they want to plan for that. Great, good to know. Um, how does financial aid work in divorced parent situations if the non-custodial parent has a 529 account for the child? Okay, so this is one that's come up a couple times. So uh, for financial aid purposes, if your parents are divorced, they are going to want the financial information of the parent you live with most. So they don't even look at like taxes, they're looking at who you live with most. So if you live with, like for example, one parent, uh, and that's who you're reporting on the financial aid application, but your other parent has a 529 plan, what's going to happen is you're not going to report that for the first year because you're just reporting the first parent's income and assets. But next year, it's going to ask you on the application, 
have you had your educational expenses paid for by anyone else? And it's going to convert that asset from your second parent into a uh, income for the 2020 year for you. So it's going to impact you not for the 2021-2022 application, but the 2022-2023 application. It will impact you a little bit. All right. So I just got verification on that Seattle promise and um, that was correct. It does not cover the summer before um, that fall quarter. So um, that would not be an option. And where can I sign up for Washington State grants? Um, oh, go ahead. Uh, the fast for the WASA. So your Washington grants are included in your financial aid package through the FAFSA or through the WASA. All right, these are some great questions. I, I know. That. I'm okay. writing some of these down, you guys. <laughs> um, here's another good one, Christina. I'm so glad you were on this call. Um, we are guardians to our niece, but the guardianship runs out when she turns 18. Does that help her or hurt her with financial aid? Will um, are my husband and my income still be used in future FAFSAs? So as the legal guardian, um, uh, if you're a legal guardian, as in you went through the court process, um, when the student applies, it's going to ask, uh, are you in a legal guardianship? So if your student, um, depending on when your student turns 18, um, they're going to answer that question as of the time they apply for financial aid. So they're going to select yes, and it's going to be their income only. Uh, after that, um, it's going to ask if you've been in a legal guardianship. If they should be independent uh, until they turn 24 because of the legal guardianship. They may require the legal guardianship paperwork in a verification process at the college. So you want to make sure that your student has access to that. All right, great. So our next question is, I'm confused about the FSAID. Is that a precursor to the FAFSA? Mm -hmm. It is. It's just you creating an account to start the application process. And so you create the account and that's what you're going to use to sign your application year after year. Um, and so it's one of the things that is the first step, let's say, to your financial aid application. Great. Um, this is another great one about Seattle Promise. If I qualify for the Promise program, but then move to a different city other than Seattle when college starts, will I still be eligible for the Promise program? I believe that answer is yes, as long as you graduated from Seattle Public Schools and met all the milestones required for the scholarship. Um, but I am going to ask Seattle Promise to verify that email for me and I will come back and confirm as soon as I hear from them. Um, where do you get the FAFSA calculator for qualifying? Oh, um, it is, uh, and we don't have the ability to put links in. Um, it is, if you go to, I'll pull it up and just read the website out loud. Um, if you go to uh, wsac.wa.gov forward slash 12th dash year dash campaign, it's at the top underneath financial aid calculator. All right. Um, Someone told me that if your household income is over 100,000, you can pretty much assume that you won't be eligible for any financial aid. Is that true? Is there a certain income that you can assume you won't be eligible for aid? We've kind of touched on this, but I'll let you repeat again, Christina, just to let everybody know. Uh, it depends on your household size. And so I encourage every family that has a student going to college next year to apply for aid because it really has to do with your household size. And then when it comes down to the aid package, it has to also do with your cost of attendance. Yeah, you just never know. Go for it. Yep. <laughs> um, what other sites do you recommend to go to for scholarships? Um, again, I, in Naviance, there's a scholarship search tool there. 
Um, Seattle Public Schools also puts out a monthly scholarship bulletin that highlights a lot of local scholarships, and those are distributed through your school counseling offices. Um, and additionally, there's the washboard.org, which I believe Christina highlighted. Are there any other sites you recommend, Christina? There's a really cool website uh, for the Beyond 1079 conference. If you just uh, Google Beyond 1079 uh, conference uh, scholarship list, they have a 45 page list of scholarships that have no citizenship requirements. Uh, and so they don't look at documentation status and they have in-state and out-of-state scholarships on there and including a scholarship guide to help you write scholarships um, at, in any status. Great. Um, and just to go back to the Seattle Promise question, um, the requirement is for the student to graduate from a Seattle Public High School. The city they live in, either in high school or afterwards, does not impact their eligibility. So just wanted to confirm that with everyone. Just need to graduate from SPS. Um, what if a student lives equal time between two parents, divorced households, and the household income of one is much lower? If they spend one more day a year at the lower income household, can you use that one? So it literally, like that's, uh, a common question is what do I do if it's a 50-50 split and there's 365 days in a year so that student's going to spend one more day at one house than another. Uh, the next determining factor on who the parent is and who is who's providing the most support. So if you can't determine uh, by who's spending the night the most or spending the most time at one house then they go by who's providing the most support. So you'd have to make a determination for your home. But yes, it does come down to literally, I have families who are like, I know that you spend one extra night here, so we're gonna use this income. And it just ha you know, it can be um, you know, different between the two households. All right, um, when you apply for the FSA ID, can the email be the parents, even though the SSN is for the students? For students uh, who are neurodiverse, they are not going to be navigating any of this on their own. They'll need the parent to help. I would create, so the FSA ID can only be assigned to one email address. And so the parent also needs to have an FSA ID to sign. So you're gonna have to have two separate email addresses for that. What I've had students, if you have a Gmail account, what I've had students do before is create I don't know if they're called vanity accounts, but it's basically you can create sub accounts um, with tags on them that will have different email addresses, but come into the same inbox. So like I literally have one for coupons. Um, <laughs> that way it doesn't fill up my inbox, but it's like my um, my email address plus coupons and it ends up going straight to that inbox. So you may want to look on if you have Gmail, that might be a way to do it where you get them all into one box. But you have to have separate email addresses for the different FSA IDs. Great. Um, another Seattle Promise question. So we'll probably confirm in a minute, but I think I can take an initial stab at it. How soon must you be enrolled in college to use a Promise scholarship? For example, can you take six a six month break after high school and then enroll in college using the Seattle Promise scholarship? I believe you need to enroll as part of the milestones immediately, um, the fall immediately after graduating from high school, um, but we'll get verification on that and come back. Next question, how do you know if you need to do a CSS application? Do you submit both the FAFSA and CSS to certain schools? Is it better for students to have money in their own savings account or in a family savings account? Um, questions. Great question. For the savings account, it doesn't matter um, if they have it in their own account uh, and it's their own asset. It's not going to be, it's not too much of a change if they're a dependent student. Um, for the CSS profile, the school will let you know on their website if they require a CSS profile in addition to the FOSFA to be considered for financial aid beyond federal aid and state aid. So it's more institutional aid. And so they'll let you know on their website. And in that case, you would be submitting a FOSFA or a WAFSA and a CSS profile. OK. A, oh, go ahead. It's a supplemental application. 
Okay. Um, so we definitely will qualify for the FAFSA and have applied on October 1st, but not sure if we can apply with promise at a different school. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm totally following, but I think this is if your student is doing running start. Um, they should have a home school that they're affiliated with for um, a home high school and um, that school will have a Seattle Promise um, support staff person supporting um, students there and so they will just need to make sure they complete the applications. They can reach out to that staff person with questions, reach out to their counselor um, and they should be able to um, apply for Promise. Um, if they're considering other colleges, um, they can apply to other colleges as well and just always have Promise as one of their choices. I encourage students to just go for that Seattle Promise because I know right now students don't know where they're going to land. Um, and so as long as they're keeping up with those Seattle Promise milestones and application steps, um, they will leave that as an option for um, um, down the road. You just don't want to close that door until you really know what you want to do. Um, and I just had another answer come in on my previous Seattle Promise question. Um, and the answer is yes, you need to enroll the fall after high school. The only exception would be if the student had a serious extenuating circumstance, for example, a serious health issue that delayed their enrollment into college. All right, we are going to continue on. Do both students and guardian, parent guardian need to fill out the FAFSA form or should it just be one of us? That's a good question. Uh, it will be the student will apply for the financial aid application, so it's their application and then they need one parent to sign the application. So it'll be, um, if you're married, it's gonna be both parents' income information, but only one parent has to sign it. All right, if my daughter is listed on the 529 plan, but the parent is listed as the custodian, whose asset is it? If the, if the parent is the owner of the, or if they're, if the parent's the custodian of the student, it just depends on who the application, if who the owner of the application is. They are the one who that's their asset. So if it's in the student's name, um, it's the students, even if they're a dependent student. Okay. Um, if I am planning to apply to go to college out of state, should I apply to in-state scholarships such as Seattle Promise? Also, should I ignore financial aid options from schools that I have no intention of applying to? Um, I'll take a stab at this one. Um, just because circumstances change, I mean, I think our seniors in the class of 2020 were not expecting COVID to come when they were applying to colleges last fall. Um, so I recommend uh, applying for Seattle Promise anyway, just so you have that as an option should something change. Um, as well as, um, you know, keeping a couple other in-state options open is always a good idea. Um, and so some of those scholarships may be good to explore as well. Uh, Christina, did you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I think that that pretty much covers it. I think, yeah. How oh, great. This is a good one. I like this one, Christina. How can we tell when a scholarship is reliable or a scam? Oh, that's a great one. So if you're applying for a scholarship, you're asking someone for money. A good sign that it's a scam is when they ask you for money. So if you're paying to apply for a scholarship, it's most likely a hustle. You're providing somebody a scholarship or at least you're buying them dinner. So if it charges money, it's probably not legitimate for a scholarship. Um, the other ones that I've found is like that you have to buy an associated product, like that it's not like there's, if there's any more money transactions in that process, uh, then typically that's a red flag. I encourage you to look at the washboard for some of the scholarships there, but you'll find some that literally will say this costs money. The other thing is if you ever get uh, asked to pay to apply for financial aid, it is also the wrong application. The FAFSA and the WAFSA are both free. 
And so you want to make sure if you're applying for the FOSFA and they say that it costs like 80 bucks, it's the wrong website. You just want to make sure you're on the right, right website. Great, thank you. Um, okay, we're going to cruise through as many more as we can here, but we're getting close to time to wrap up. Um, does the FAFSA take into account younger siblings who will need money for college? Oh, yes. It'll ask you the, the size of your household and the number going to college. They definitely consider that. I run my own business and saw a question that asked for entire checking and savings account balance. I have to pay quarterly taxes into my and so my accounts look larger than they really are. Um, is there a place on the application to add further information or should I try to calculate the balance with the extra money removed? So it's going to ask for your personal checking and savings. If it's in your business name, that is a sometimes a business asset if you have like an LLC. So what you're going to want to do is um, if you're not paying those taxes right now, it's in the account, you have a couple options. You can report it and then reach out to the financial aid office and let them know it's a one-time payment and that it's not funds that you have as an asset, but a payment towards taxes. I've also had some families uh, put that aside in a business account uh, for their, for their uh, taxes. Okay, if I'm going to community college for one to two years and then transferring to a four year, what do I put as a degree or certification I will be working on next year when completing my FAFSA? Uh, for the FAFSA, put down your overall goal for, for uh, next year. So if you're working towards your uh, associate's degree for that year, uh, you can put associates, but um, if you're transferring that next year, then, you can, then on that application, you'll put bachelor's. The most important piece is that you don't list that you're a graduate student. I know you all ha will have graduated, but graduate students is the next degree beyond your bachelor's. And so when you click that, it sometimes keeps you from getting funding that's for undergraduate degrees. Um, I think we touched on this one already. How much annual income can your parents make or how much income that your parents make will start making it less likely that you get financial aid? Just yeah, depends. just depends. Um, if you are divorced and your child resides, I think we touched on this one already to 50% of nights with mother and 50% of nights with father, but this is not in line with the original court ordered split 3565. Do you put down the reality truth or what is in your court order? I would put the reality. They're asking for where the student's sleeping, but they're not going to look at the court order. They're going to look at, uh, they're going to go by where the student's living 51% uh, or more of the time. And if there's no full, um, like if you can't split that, then at the next determination is who's providing the most support. If you use Seattle Promise, will you still be eligible for financial aid? Um, yes. Um, so complete that FAFSA and I think there in some cases there may be additional aid um, in addition to Seattle Promise that you can um, access. So um, and then after you are done with your two years of Seattle Promise you want to continue to file that FAFSA if you plan on transferring to a four year to access your financial aid. Um, this might be too complicated to answer, but how do colleges determine unmet need? And will a family's expected contribution be different from school to school? Um, so the ESC is going to be the same, but the cost of attendance is going to change from school to school. So like um, if you're going to a community college, the tuition is going to be less and they're going to consider that and how they provide aid to you. Whereas if you're going to a university, the tuition's higher and they know the cost of attendance is higher and that's gonna change your award package. If I'm applying for overseas universities, should I apply for the FAFSA? I would say yes, because if they're associated with a university in the US, sometimes you can still go overseas and receive federal aid. So it depends on the institution, but I always say apply, especially if what happens um, like right now, you can't really go to any other countries. Like we have a, a, a ban uh, to other countries. So if your uh, plans change and you can't get in right away because of um, COVID, then you have a backup plan and funding for it. Okay, so 
One final question. I am going to community college next year, but if I get recruited for sports, I may go somewhere else, but I have no idea where. Can I add a school later? Oh, definitely. I encourage you, if you get rec rec recruited for sports, you want to make sure you're applying for financial aid because that goes along with any scholarships a school may be providing to you. So if you know some schools are scouting you pretty heavily and you don't have a lot, of, you know, you have 10 choices you can put on that FOSFA. If you know that someone's watching your film or coming to your games, or if you're not having games right now watching your film and they're interested in you, you can already add them to the FOSFA or WAFSA, or to the FAFSA, I mean. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, and thank you to all of you who joined us tonight. I know there are more questions. And so I am, Christina, is it okay if I reach out to you to get answers for some that I may not have answers to? Of and course. If people want to email ccr at seattleschools.org with your question. If it did not get answered, we will follow up with you directly. Um, and I appreciate everyone's flexibility with our Q&A challenges. Um, I also want to um, thank our sign language interpreters for being here tonight. Um, have a great evening, everyone, and please check out our other events if you need additional support. Um, and email ccr at seattleschools.org as well. We're happy to help you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.